Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our service this morning. Our call to worship is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you for who you are and what you have done. You are the healer. Bring healing and restoration to those who are broken. You are the God of peace. Bring comfort to our chaos. You are our provider. Increase our trust in you and you alone. You are the God who is with us. Let us enter your presence with joy and confidence. You are the Lord of hosts. Bring victory in our struggles. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray all these. Amen.
God Almighty, the Holy Eternal One, our dearest Abba Father, and our true and faithful friend, we come to you, the one who himself knows the agony of lonely tears in the garden, and stays firmly by our side to speak quiet words of comfort to the deepest fears of our heart. We come to you, knowing that you alone have the words of life. You are risen from the grave. You are alive forever and ever, and have the power to write our names into the Lamb's Book of Life. Our hearts ache, along with Vincent and Cedric, for the company of grace, and yet find solace that her every moment on this earth was as you have planned and designed, and you have brought her from the finish line of her race run well in this world to her place of rest, fullness, restoration, and perfect joy, to adventure with you in the everlasting body that you have prepared for her from the very beginning, until we will meet again at your side. May the comfort of your supernatural presence your loving voice and gentle embrace be Vincent and Cedric's strength in this season. We pray for the sickness of our world, for those suffering from COVID-19, from cancer and other conditions, especially for our members who are homebound. If it is your will, I pray that you will heal them, Lord. I ask that you be with them, comfort them, and provide them with peace. Be with their families that are struggling as they watch their loved ones suffer. Provide them with your love and sustain them with your hope. Our hearts cry out for those who have suffered in the recent natural disasters. The catastrophe of homes destroyed and people displaced by the floods in Timor and the cyclone in India. We are nearly numb with the daily news of new lockdowns, infection rates, deaths, and the hospitals in many countries filled beyond capacity as we watch the ravages of COVID infections across the world. We lift up these countries and pray for your mercy and protection over them, and Singapore as well. May we have patience and resilience as we trust you, and righteous hearts and hands that are willing to reach out in faith and action, to care for the least of these as we would for you. And every day, the newscasts hold a mirror up to our own heart of darkness to document the atrocities and suffering from years of bitter fighting and hatred in Tigray, Ethiopia, in Gaza, Palestine, in Israel, in Yemen, and in Myanmar. Our world is torn with war and violence. I pray that you will provide this world with a peace that is only found in you. I pray for those who are suffering from the results of war and violence, that you will provide them with both physical and mental healing. We pray for an end to these wars and acts of violence, for your redemption, an end to all the divisions between individuals, groups, and nations. We pray for your healing an end to all the trauma and hurting, for your love to reign over all. We pray for our church care groups, the various ministries, the outreach activities, the Sunday school children, the youth and young adults. We lift up the English and Mandarin Hokkien congregations. Thank you for the small groups meeting up and the bonding together to support and spur each other on. We lift up our pastors and church leaders for you to grant them the wisdom of humble obedience to you. I pray for our church that we will be found worthy of bearing your name. We are so incredibly in need of your power and your strength. We ask that you would fill us up with your spirit of love and unity among believers all around our world. We ask for your help to set aside differences and look to the greater cause, the cause of Christ. Please help us to truly live out a life of love. We know that this is only possible through the power of your Spirit, so we ask that you would move across our land in miraculous ways, with fresh filling and awareness, turning your people back to you, 
drawing others to come to know you. We need your unity and your love to stir our hearts and give direction to our days. We need your love and wisdom to guide us. We need your spirit to lead us, to live out godly lives that would first bring honor to you. We thank you that you are always with us and give us great purpose and hope. Help us to live lives that are a source of light to those who need you, whose words bring the salt of the gospel message to the lives that you have entrusted to us. We pray for divine appointments that you will use to have us intervene in these lives and that we will have courage to share our testimonies of your goodness and direct them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, today's scripture reading is from Psalm 102, a prayer of an afflicted person who has grown weak and pours out a lament before the Lord. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me. When I call, answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress, I groan aloud and am reduced to skin and bones. I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake. I have become like a bird alone on a roof. All day long, my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. For I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears. Because of your great wrath, for you have taken me up and thrown me aside. My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to show favor to her.
The appointed time has come, for her stones are dear to your servants. Her very dust moves them to pity. The nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the kings of the earth will revere your glory. For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Let this be written for a future generation, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned to death. So the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, where the peoples and the kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord. In the course of my life, he broke my strength. He cut short my days. So I said, Do not take me away, my God. In the midst of my days, your years go on through all generations. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be discarded. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, church. Hope everyone is staying well and healthy and safe. Today we continue our series in the Psalms. We are now in Psalm 102. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 102 and we'll be looking at this Psalm a bit more closely. Let me begin with a quotation. Tears are the bleeding of the soul. Have you heard that one before? Tears are the bleeding of the soul. In Psalm 102, we find a man who is bleeding. We don't know his name, but I'm sure that we know something of his experience. First of all, let's look at the content of his prayer. It begins with an urgent appeal, verses 1 and 2. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. It goes from prayer to a cry for help to distress. And then answer me quickly. There's a sense of urgency. The message translates it this way, Don't turn your back on me just when I desperately need you. Don't turn your back on me just when I desperately need you. What was it that troubled him? Well, we see in verses 3 to 11, His days vanish like smoke, my bones burn. Again, the message uh, is helpful here. I'm wasting away. I'm burning up with fever. So there was a physical problem. But secondly, he also says, my heart is blighted and withered like grass. What does blighted mean? It means devastated, ruined or spoiled. The country, for example, has been blighted by drought. Again, the message says, I'm a ghost of my former self, consumed by terminal illness. Consumed by terminal illness. I'm reduced to skin and bones just like Job was in chapter 19 and verse 20. Then thirdly, he describes himself as a desert owl, verse 6. Owls were associated with ruins and deserted places. So he's isolated. There's emotional suffering as well. Fourthly, he says, All day long my enemies taunt me. There are relational problems. Fifthly, I eat ashes as my food. Verse 9, sackcloth and ashes in those days were signs of grief during disaster. And he cries so many tears that they drip, they literally drip into his drink. Sixthly, because of your great wrath, verse 10, you have taken me up and thrown me aside like a tornado 
or a cyclone picks up a house or a car and flings it miles away. Again, Job chapter 30, you toss me about in a storm. His suffering is so intense that it feels like God is angry with him and has deserted him, even though there's no mention of sin in this psalm. I wonder if this reminds you of someone centuries down the road who felt thrown aside, forsaken. It's a pointer to Jesus, isn't it? To describe the distress that he felt as he went to the cross. Notice that the psalmist is in such deep despair that he thinks he will die soon. Verse 11, he likens himself to a passing shadow or grass that dries up on the ground. And yet, there's no mention that God has rejected him because of any sin. Nor does he turn away from God. In fact, I think it is great that we find in the Psalms several songs in a minor key, so to speak. Psalms that express distress or sadness, loneliness, etc. Because the Bible tells us very clearly, Psalm, uh, sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, for example, that there's a time to mourn and there's also a time to dance, a time to weep and a time to laugh. So, Psalms of lament are entirely appropriate. Secondly, we see the convictions behind his prayer. Convictions behind his prayer. Despite his distress, the afflicted man believed certain truths about God. Number one, that God is sovereign. Look at verse 12. You, O Lord, sit enthroned forever. Secondly, God is compassionate to Zion, that is his people, his city. Uh, he shows favor, verse 13. He shows favor. Uh, verse 14, her stones are dear to your servants. Is this the stones of the temple that was in ruins? It even says the dust, the very dust, moves them to pity, verse 14b. So the dust of the ruins of the place, whether it was the gates or the temple, we don't quite know. But even this moves his people to pity. What more God? And then in verse 16, he says, The Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. Perhaps this is a reference to rebuilding after return from the Babylonian exile. Well, uh, that clearly shows that God is compassionate to Zion. But thirdly, God is also responsive to the prayers of those who are in need. Look at verse 17. And for he will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Fourthly, God looks down to hear the groans of his people and to release those condemned to death. We find that in verse 19 and following. Just as he heard the groaning of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt and he delivered them from Pharaoh, so in the same way, God looked down to hear the groans of those who are in distress, distress and to come to their help. And ultimately, the psalmist believes that God's name and his praise will be declared in Zion, verses 21 and following. In other words, he sees by faith all the way into the future to a day when the nations not just Israel but the nations of the world will gather to worship in Jerusalem I think it's so impressive that uh, this man although in great distress and pain he had the discipline not to wallow in self-pity not to allow his, his personal grief to, to engulf him but he was able to see God's character in spite of his pain. He had what we would say a forward-looking faith that things would improve because he believed that God was in control and in spite of his condition, things would be in God's hands. Thirdly, then and only then we see 
confidence to pray. Verses 23 to 28. Now, he asks not on the basis of his personal suffering, but he asks on the basis of who God is. His faithfulness, his character to his covenant people and to him as well. And so it says in verse 24, So I said, because of my convictions about God, so I dare to ask, so now I am asking for myself, do not take me away in the midst of my days. It's 24 verses later that the psalmist makes his request. Finally, he asks for himself. Would you have waited so long before asking for yourself to be delivered? When we teach uh, young believers how to pray, we give them this uh, acronym X, A-C-T-S. A stands for adoration, that is to praise and to exalt God. Secondly, to confess their sins before the Lord. Thirdly, to give thanks for things that He has blessed them with in, his, in their lives. And then, and only then, after they have done the first three, then they come to the fourth, which is supplication, which means to ask. Now here, the psalmist has actually followed that. He's adored God, he's given thanks, and now he feels ready to make supplication for himself. So we see that he asks, first of all, with humility. Verses 24 and following, your years, your years, as compared to my days. He said, do not take me away, O oh my God, in the midst of my days. Your years go on through all generations. You see the difference between years of the Lord and my days, which are so short. Uh, you will listen to me. You will see the difference in your strength and my weakness. In other words, the psalmist acknowledges his finiteness compared to this eternal and omnipotent God. So he asks with humility. Secondly, he asks with confidence. Verses 25 to 27. He says, Even the heavens and the earth will perish. They will wear out. <clears throat> they will be changed and discarded. But you, Lord, you will remain the same and you will never end. <clears throat> He prays with confidence in the immutability of God. Immutable means never changing, unchanging. God is immutable. So he says, I come with humility and I come with confidence in you because you are the same, you will never change. It's interesting that uh, this section, verses 25 to 27, is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. And the author of Hebrews writes this in connection with with Jesus, Hebrews 1 says that Jesus is superior to angels because angels are created beings who worship Jesus, who worship God. But Jesus, by contrast, is God's eternal Son and therefore superior to the angels. Therefore, Jesus is God. He's superior to the angels. In fact, Hebrews goes on to say in chapter 13, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is God. That's why Hebrews goes back to this passage to quote him, uh, quote it in Hebrews chapter 1. But then in verse 28, he has another assurance. He says, The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you. In other words, the children of those who serve God will live in God's presence. They will be safe, in other words. They will be under His protection. Their descendants will be secure. Now, we have to ask ourselves though, is this an automatic thing? Will the children of all believers, the next generation and the next generation, automatically be saved and automatically belong to God? Well, the answer is found in the very next psalm. Look at Psalm 103 and verse 17 and following. Look at verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, 
The Lord's love is with those who fear Him, those who fear Him, and His righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep His covenant, covenant, excuse me, with those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. Is it automatic? No, it is not. It is for those who keep His covenant and remember to obey His precepts. Even if they are children of God's servants, even if they are children who, uh, who are born in the next generation of those who are faithful, they still have to learn to keep God's covenant and remember to obey His precepts. Now, is there relevance for us today? I think so. Yes, God's purposes will be accomplished. We can assume that because it is God who wills His purposes. But the big question is, will our children, will our children be part of God's purposes? Will they keep His commandments? Will they obey His precepts? I think this is a good reminder to parents that we have the primary responsibility to guide our children into paths of righteousness. If we want our children to walk the talk, then we as parents must talk the walk and walk with our children. It is our biblical responsibility to not only enjoy our children and our grandchildren, but to engage them, to edify them, to build them up, no matter how old they are. Sunday school teachers supplement our input. They are not substitutes for parents and they cannot take the place of parental responsibilities. Here is a picture of our children when they were very small. There's a five-year gap between our son and our daughter. And here's a lovely picture of them which I shall always treasure, where I took a picture of them reading their Bibles before bedtime. Very often I had to be in church in the evenings when they went to bed, so my wife uh, made sure that they were ready for bed and always made sure that they read the Bible, uh, children's version of the Bibles, and prayed with them, prayed for them. And uh, one by one they both came to the Lord when they were young. Of course, their understanding of faith as children is different from adults, and we expect that. But God honors that. God accepts the fact that they come as, as little children with their particular level of understanding. Uh, we have our level of understanding. The children have theirs. It is our responsibility to lead them to faith so that they will walk faithfully with the Lord all their lives. And years later, I wrote down uh, a note to our children. I entitled it 10 most important things that I want my children to know before I die. 10 most important things I want my children to know before I die. And I share with you two of them here. Number one, and this was the top of the list. God is utterly trustworthy. And two, Manage your life and your possessions for optimum effectiveness according to kingdom priorities. Optimum effectiveness according to kingdom priorities. And I'm so happy to know and to see that my children continue to walk with the Lord. Uh, they have their own families now, they have their own children now, but they are walking with the Lord and they're teaching them what we taught them when they were young, to be faithful to God. What convictions about God, about the Bible, about what you have learned in your spiritual life, what convictions can you share with your children today? Whether they are young or they are teenagers or they are grown up, there are some things that we can still drop like little seeds into their lives. Don't neglect your responsibility to do so. Okay, so what are the lessons that we can learn? Number one, pour out your heart freely to God. Jesus understands. In times of distress, pour out your heart to God. 
it is actually hypocritical to pretend that everything is always fine in our lives. There must be a place to bring pain and sorrow to God as well as joy and celebration. Whether it's individually or whether it's corporately in the church, there must be a place to bring pain and sorrow to God as well as joy and celebration. Did Jesus weep and pour out his heart to his Father in prayer? Did Jesus cry? Yes, he did. We find that several times in the scriptures. So why shouldn't we cry? It's part of our humanity, isn't it? To show emotion, to weep, to be in distress. The wonderful thing is that God knows what distresses you. Whether it is a spiritual or emotional or a psychological or a financial or a relational thing that causes you distress. It may be due to your own foolishness or someone else's carelessness or just due to the fact that we are living in a sinful world. There are many things that can distress us and we need to be realistic and admit them. Whatever distress we are facing, God has allowed it. And as we, as we grapple with those things that cause us distress, as we grapple in His strength and His wisdom and by His grace, the whole process will mold us to be Christ-like. In other words, some good will come out of it. Some good will come out of it. Look at what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. He says, We suffered hardships under great pressure beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. In other words, they were distressed. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. They felt like they were going to die. But this happened to teach us what was the lesson that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead as far as Paul was concerned he was as good as dead but Paul also says in the same breath God allowed this to happen so that he would learn to rely on God who is able to raise even the dead if he can raise the dead, he can certainly rescue us from our distress. In Paul's case, the purpose was to teach reliance on God. What about you? What is God trying to teach you today in your distress? Secondly, hold on to God in your distress. Hold on to God in your distress. In this psalm, nothing seemed to improve. At the end of the psalm, he still had to continue in his distress. There was no immediate answer. And sometimes if things don't improve in our lives, we may just have to persevere, persevere in spite of the distress that God is putting us through. But we must also believe that God will sustain us through the pain. The psalm ends with no improvement, no answer from God. You know, our lives are not like those murder mysteries that we see on the TV. Everything has to be solved in 55 minutes before the one hour is up, before the program ends. Or every injustice has to be sorted out within a 90-minute movie. Life is not like that. In real life, there are murders which go unsolved for years and years. And there are pains in real life that are carried on for years and years, even down to the next generation. It is not so easy. And God knows that. Think, for example, of righteous Job. Job had to endure the loss of his whole family, and he also had to endure insensitive friends who were convinced that he deserved this punishment. They were convinced that surely he has done something wrong. And it took years to rebuild his family by God's grace. But God was with him throughout and blessed him far more in latter years. Think of sinless Jesus 
who had to endure persecution and injustice, suffering, betrayal, and shameful crucifixion. When Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he cried that out on the cross, there was no immediate answer. He died in pain. And it was only three days later that God raised him from the dead and vindicated him as the Son of God, as Lord over sin and death. So here, in Psalm 102, the psalmist suffered. And he asked God for help. He had no answer when he wrote this psalm because God had not yet responded to his prayer. And so meanwhile, he had to wait and wait in his distress. And this psalm finds him praying and then now waiting, still in distress, for God to answer. We too may have to go through that same experience, having to wait in silence and in considerable pain. But let it be a waiting that is full of trust and full of unwavering faith in God who never changes. Let it be a waiting that is full of trust and unwavering faith in a God who never changes. Psalm 31, verses 9, 14, and 15 say, My eyes are weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. But, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. My times are in your hands. Warren Wiersbe writes this, God enjoys endless years, but we endure shortened days, troubled days, days that disappear like smoke, grass like a shadow. We sit alone like birds in the desert and dying patients in hospital. How depressing. Do you have days like that? Looking at yourself and your feelings will only make things worse. Do what the writer did. Look from your condition to faith in the Lord. Look from your personal condition to faith in the Lord. That's good advice. Here's my summary. There is a place for tears and lament in our spiritual life. God invites you, invites us to freely pour out our hearts to Him. Be comforted that Jesus was like us. He was human in every way. He will help us because He understands us fully. And praise God, He is faithful to us forever. He is faithful to us forever. I close with a stanza from a very old Christian song. It goes like this. When answers aren't enough, there is Jesus. He is more than just an answer to your prayers. And your heart will find the safe and peaceful refuge. When answers aren't enough, He's there. When answers aren't enough, He's there. Let's pray. Father, You know everything that goes on in our hearts and our minds and in our daily lives. You know what gives us joy and You know what pulls us down. You know when we are happy and when we are in distress. Lord, we are so grateful that you understand all that we go through. And we surrender, Lord, we surrender all our circumstances to you. You are the God of justice and love. 
you alone have all the answers and you will sort all these things out in your time and in your wisdom. But meanwhile, Father, we ask that you will give us strength to persevere, even through our personal pain. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who endured the greatest pain for us that we might have the greatest joy. Thank you. In his name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to um, listen to a newish song which was written by a Christian from Frankel Bethesda Church, Singapore and used with permission. The song is entitled Even This, Even Now. Press in and courage breaks. Even on my knees, you lift my head, and I will rise, I will sing, and give to you this offering, O oh Lord my God. I bow, giving thanks for even this, even now. And in the questions will keep me from despair. When fears consume me, Lord, hear my prayer that I will find you. You will be enough, O oh Christ, my rock, God of my soul, strength of my heart. And I will rise, I will sing, and give to you this offering, O oh Lord, my God. I trust you. And I'll give thanks for even this need now No mountain high, no ocean death No trial in life, not even death Not the past today, tomorrow Loudest laughter, silent sorrow No fate, no destiny Can take your love away from me You are my God At the cross Help me see Boundless love Poured out for me And hear your voice Rise above the crowd Giving strength for even this even now And I will rest In even this Even now A very big welcome to each of you for joining us for our Sunday online worship service this morning. There are a few announcements to highlight. It is with deep sadness that we announce that Grace Chu was called home on the 16th of May after a long illness. The cremation was held on Wednesday afternoon. 
we convey our condolences to her husband Vincent and their son Cedric. Please do remember their family in prayer. Now the enhanced restrictions for COVID mean that our Sunday services will continue to be recorded and broadcast via our YouTube channel every Sunday at 9 a.m. from now until further notice. Please refer to our e-bulletin being circulated by WhatsApp for additional information on the prayer items, the sermon forecast, as well as how to connect to our church family and care groups. Coming up for next Sunday on the sermon forecast for 30th of May is Psalm 139, Everything About Me You Know by Pastor Graham. Uh, please continue to support our church through your offerings and tithes via uh, the Pay Now code uh, provided and the special collections uh, are using a special collection Pay Now code. Thanks again for worshipping us with us today. Stay safe and have a great week. God bless. Let me now close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light and love of his covenant upon you and grant you his peace, now and always. Amen. before